Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to session number four, Building Social Connectedness in a Disconnected World. I am Susan Ryan, Senior Director of the Greenhouse Project, and I'm delighted that you have, been, you have joined us on what I consider a really important topic. You know, I think as humans, we just crave that social connection and that, that connection with other humans and COVID-19, this pandemic has certainly exacerbated what I would call the real loneliness challenge. And so today's session, we're going to really talk about living with risk and why it's so important to be able to understand how we find that balance. It fits with the Greenhouse Project's theme that go beyond better and why we really seek to push against the status quo that settles for good enough and to really go beyond better. So some logistics that you should know about today. We'd love for you to use the chat box to introduce yourself. Let us know where you're calling in from. And the chat box is kind of our way to be connected. The other thing that you will notice is that there's a, a Q&A box. And at the end, we're gonna save some time for you to get your questions answered. We've got an incredible speaker today, an incredible session. And I know that you'll have some questions that uh, you'll want to ask Dr. Power. So on the next slide, you will see that this uh, series is sponsored by It's Never Too Late and we are grateful for that support and their passion to really, how they have used their technology really to support social connections during the pandemic. So I'm gonna welcome my friend and uh, the sponsor, Jack York, and uh, invite you to say a few words, Jack. Well, first of all, Susan, let's do a big greenhouse round of applause for you being a woman of distinction for McKnight's. Are you going to remember the little people along the way? <laughs> it's, it's always about the little people, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's right below the Nobel Peace Prize, so I'm I'm honored to uh, to know you. But in all seriousness, that's a great, uh, such a well deserved award for the tireless work that you've done over the years. And obviously, as people who have watched any of the series know, that you and I have a lot of uh, umbrella drinks over the years, going over the importance of all this and. You, uh, you have taught me the right way to say the right things, but I don't always understand them. So anyway, thanks for, congratulations for that. And I and 12, we, you know, it's a, uh, not just I and 12, but I think one of the silver linings from the pandemic is all of a sudden this whole issue of isolation getting the priority that it, that it, that it needs to have. And it's cool to be, you know, one of a, a, a myriad of solutions that are out there that really make a, that make a big difference. So congratulations, and we're honored to, uh, to be a sponsor. Thank you, Jack. And I, I will just add to that. It really, it was just no question when I talked to you about this series, it was like, of course, yeah, we want to be there. So again, really grateful for all that you've done during the pandemic, the um, technology that you've offered and, and what that's done to support everybody. So I'm going to ask our audience now, we'd love to do a poll and get some of your feedback. What is your current status for visitors? So there has been this blanket ban on visitation. So really curious to find out from you whether it's none, it's only for elders who are actively dying, what they might call a compassionate visit, one visit per day, uh, more than one visitor per day or it's not applicable to you. So please, if you take just a moment to indicate uh, for you what the visitation policy is for your community. And thank you for jumping right on there and participating in our poll. All right, Janet, I'll let you stop the poll. Show us those results. Ah. So the majority of you, it's not applicable. Um, and then I would say the other large response, well, we've got a couple here. More than one visitor today, 20% of you said that was the case and another 14% said only for elders who are actively dying. All right, well, very interesting. And then 10% said absolutely none. And another 10% said one visitor per day. 
Very interesting. Let's hit that second poll. So when you think about your current visitation policy, and I'll have Janet launch that, how would you evaluate your current visitation policy? And I guess this would be applicable to those of you who have one. Um, is it too strict? Do you feel it's just right or it's not strict enough? So if this is applicable to you, I'd love to have you weigh in here. And thanks for jumping in. It's always interesting to kind of poll our participants and see what's happening out there. All right, Janet, we'll stop the poll. All right, so 53% of you said it was just right, but an, another 44%, so it's almost 50-50, uh, almost but 44% said it was uh, too strict and only 4% said it was uh, not strict enough. All right, one more poll, if you put that up. Since the pandemic began, has your use of antipsychotics for people with dementia increased, stayed the same, decreased, or unsure? So obviously, if this is not applicable, you would hit unsure. But interesting to see how social um, isolation has impacted your usage of antipsychotics, or if you even know. So thanks once again for your responses. All right, Janet, you can stop that poll. Likely unsure. And 23% of you said it stayed the same. 7% um, said it increased. And because we're not really measuring right now, it, it's uh, hard to say. And I, I think I would wager a guess um, if I were to look out nationwide, but uh, I'll, I'll suspend that for another time. So Jack York has requested the distinct honor of introducing our incredible speaker today. And I almost wanted to arm wrestle for that opportunity, but uh, I'll go ahead and, and turn well, it no, over but to Susan, Jack. I think, I think why don't you do the professional part and I'll do the, <laughs> I'll do the, the rest of the story as Paul Harvey would say. The rest of the story, yes, at the other details. Well, what I will tell you is um, Al, Dr. Power has become just an incredible friend and colleague. I have so enjoyed working with him. Al is a geriatrician. He's an international speaker. He is a well-respected author. I think I always say about Al, he had me on reduction of antipsychotics. That's where I as a nurse really bonded with his philosophy. And when he released his book, Dementia Beyond Drugs, I knew that he was really on to something. I had the distinct uh, privilege of working with Dr. Power in the group at St. John's in Rochester, New York, when they were doing their greenhouse homes. And I was their project guide at the time and, and really uh, got to know Al and the team there. Jack, it's your yeah, turn. Well, well, I'll start with the serious, uh, the serious part of this. That I really, I think what I, what I uh, respect and like about Dr. Power is, um, you, you, for someone like me who came into this whole IN2L 21 years ago without having any grounding in, in dementia, any grounding in a lot of the issues dealing with, just with, with older adults in general, you're able to articulate really serious, meaningful points in, in a way that everybody can understand. And I think a lot of times, I think people get so caught up in some of the minutia that you can forget the, the you know, what's the big picture you're trying to get to. And for people entrenched in senior living, you know, they're gonna look at it one way, but for the person that it's just, it's their mom or their dad or their husband or their wife or their grandmother or grandfather, you're able to really speak to those people in a way that, that gives hope. And, and I think has really moved the needle in a non, you know, non-judgmental way. So I, I really do, a, 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 you know, appreciate your friendship. I'm riveted to listen to you speak and look forward to the, to the session. I think on a on a personal note, you are you. I think everyone in the audience. I may be the only person who has seen Dr. Power sing "I Kissed a Girl and I Liked It" three <laughs> not once, not twice, but three times. And I do have those videos 
if uh, if you want to get a hold of them at uh, at a later time. And I, I'm I'm sorry, Al, that there is not a Men of Distinction Award, but we're we are hereby granting you the Greenhouse Project Man of Distinction Award uh, as you kick things off. But but keep doing what you're doing. You're changing thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Uh, like I said, in a way that uh, doesn't make people feel like me feel ignorant when you do it. So have at it, Dr. Power. Cheers. Thanks so much, Jack, for the introduction. <laughs> um, at the, yeah, the first performance of that work actually was for a uh, Mr. St. John's beauty pageant. It was kind of a kind of a joke pageant we had at St. John's, and I was one of the people that was volunteered to be a contestant. And everybody knew I played guitar, and um, and I didn't think that that would be fun enough for the talent competition. So I thought to myself, what's the last thing that this gang wants to hear at the time a 50 year old man perform? And um, so that's what I did. It took a while for people to get it, but when I got to the chorus, they all figured and, it out. And in and, and a, and a serious note though, you are, you are a great musician. People don't know that about you and it's cool to see you uh, jumping in. On another serious note, I did not win the competition, but I was, you know, I was Mr. Congeniality, I think, or something like that. But uh, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm gonna see if I'm allowed to share my screen, I am. So let's put the slideshow up here. While I'm setting this up, I just wanna make a comment. I have not done this before, but um, I was looking through the participants. Great to see a lot of my international friends. I haven't seen them all, but I just happened to notice uh, Rudy uh, and Carolyn from Western Canada, Magda from, from South Africa, uh, Anna Claude from uh, Geneva, Switzerland. It's just great to see people from around the world that I don't get to see anymore these days uh, because I can't travel. But um, I did notice a name there uh, both last time and this time. And, and um, when I started writing Dementia Beyond Drugs about 14 years ago, a little more than 14 years ago, and I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I didn't like antipsychotics and I had to try to find a way to explain that to people. So I started writing down my thoughts, sort of blog style. I started reading whatever I could get my hands on about new approaches to dementia. I hadn't read anything at that time. And I came across an article that really wowed me. It was, it was just a little article that talked about long-term care and it talked about how we take um, the natural rhythms of lived time and they get broken up into very artificial packets of clock time and of individual staff tasks. And uh, the author, Athena McLean, um, I remember writing her at the time, telling her how much I love this article. Sadly, the article is still very relevant today, I think with long-term care, but I know that she's on the call. So I just wanted to thank her once again. If you have a chance, the, the article's 15 year old, years old now, but it is very relevant. And it's just one of the best uh, written articles I've, I had read at that time and uh, really appreciated uh, and seeing your name again. Uh, so this is a picture. I, went into my photo album and, and I was in um, Western Australia, working for Alzheimer's Western Australia a few years ago. And uh, the host put me up in a lovely apartment um, near Brighton Beach, north of Perth. And I went for a walk down by the beach the first day and I was greeted near the dunes with this sign, large waves, strong current, sandbars, snakes. Um, and uh, you notice it's kind of ironic. They didn't even mention the sharks, which are kind of a given with Western Australia. But um, as you can see from that uh, selfie down below, I did actually go swimming. So I found a way to negotiate risk uh, so that I could enjoy the Indian Ocean. And uh, maybe I'll come back to this and let you know uh, how I did that because I'm not really a daredevil at all myself. Um, I don't know, I think this, maybe I should use this for a promo picture, I'm trying to decide. Uh, anyway, moving on, a few definitions to get us started. Risk, let's not talk about risk as good or bad. Risk is simply the chance that something will happen that is different from what we expect. Then there's two kinds of risk then. There's downside risk, which is the chance that something will happen that's worse than what we expect. So if Jack gets up and walks by himself, what are the chances he will fall and break a bone? Or if Susan goes outside by herself, what are the chances she might get lost or walk into traffic? Those are very real, they have to be considered. But there's also upside risk. There's also a chance that something will happen that may be better than what we expect. So if Jack is up and walks, maybe he will build his strength, his balance, his mobility and become more independent. Uh, if Susan goes outside, maybe she will be more relaxed. She'll sleep better at night, have better appetite um, and have less depression. So uh, there are both upsides and downsides to every choice we make. So I'm gonna share some, uh, what, I, what I've written now, there's some guiding principles for this talk. Uh, the first two are on the next slide. First of all, every action we take will involve some degree of both upside and downside risk. How much is upside, how much is downside, of course, will vary with each situation, but there's always two sides to every choice we make. 
But principle two also reminds us that every action we do not take will also involve some degree of upside and downside risk. So simply saying that's too risky, we won't do it, it doesn't mean that you're 100% safe because you've also taken on some additional risks by not choosing to do things. And we'll give some examples of that in a few minutes. A couple more definitions. All or none thinking is seeing every situation as requiring only one of two opposite solutions. No nuance, flexibility, or middle ground. You either can do it or you can't. Everyone can do it or no one can do it. Surplus safety is an excessive concern with the downside of risk relative to the upside. Only worrying about what can go wrong and not thinking enough about what can go right. And let's face it, uh, these two definitions describe a lot of long-term care policy in the US and I guess elsewhere as well. Not only in many regulations, but also in the policies that providers impose upon themselves. Uh, so something to think about. Next principle, when you focus on surplus safety, it's commonly associated with a loss of critical thinking skills. It often makes us think in very strange ways that don't really make any logical sense. And I love to share the story of my friend, Karen Stovey, who has started a movement called In the Moment. And she uses improv techniques to help people better engage meaningfully with people living with dementia. And Karen's mother uh, had Alzheimer's disease and lived with Karen for a while, but after a while she needed to move to assisted living. And they went to tour several different communities and they were walking through one. And they found that as they walked through the lounge that there was a beautiful courtyard right outside. It had a paved path. It had raised seats, it had a raised garden. It was a beautiful sunny day. There was a fence around the courtyard and Karen instinctively went over to the door and found it was locked. And she said to the woman giving the tour, is this door always locked? And the woman said, oh yes, the residents can't go out there. And Karen said, why? It's a beautiful space. It's a nice sunny day. And the woman said, well, people used to be able to go out there but a woman fell and got injured. And Karen's response was, tell me, has anyone ever fallen indoors and gotten injured before? So in other words, we don't say you can't be inside the building anymore because somebody fell. And yet this is the kind of thinking that we often go through in long-term care. Here's a simple example of balancing upside and downside risk. Um, my first trip to Down Under uh, eight years ago, I've been 10 times now, I've been very fortunate, but I was invited in Auckland to go visit Mercy Parklands, who was one of the organizations that was launching the Spark of Life uh, program for people with advanced dementia. And Helen on the right is a Spark of Life practitioner, but I got a tour of the place by Catherine Heaney, who's in the pink on the left. And Catherine's an occupational therapist. And when she led me around, we walked by a woman who was walking by with a walker. She was living with dementia. And we stopped and Catherine said hi to her and asked her how she was doing. And she said, fine. And we continued on our way and she continued on her way in the other direction. Catherine told me that this woman came in after a series of falls and decline at home. And she was now had been in a wheelchair. Uh, it was not felt that it was safe for her to walk when she was initially evaluated. She was very unsteady on her feet. And so she had a wheelchair without pedals and she would constantly motor around the living area in the wheelchair. And she did that for several months. And one day Catherine walked over and saw her standing in front of her wheelchair. And she said she had to bite her tongue and restrain herself from just going over and asking the woman to sit down, please. But she went over instead and with a smile and a kind voice, she said, I see you're standing. Do you want to walk? And the woman said, yes. And so she reinstituted therapy for her. And now uh, several months later, as we walked by, this woman was walking independently. So once again, the downside is she could have fallen, she could have gotten injured, but the upside of giving her a chance was that she was now independently walking, which not only was better for her health, but also better for the workload of the people that cared for her. But now let's get to a much more complicated example of upside and downside risk. And you can guess what I'm talking about. And what a great opportunity to have something so uh, present in everyone's mind to really unpack this in much more detail. So let's talk about the coronavirus pandemic. I think we know what the downside risk of COVID-19 infection is. It's a highly infectious organism. The morbidity and mortality in older people or people who are chronically ill is extremely high. Uh, there have been, as of January 28th, over 153,000 deaths in U.S. nursing homes. And keep in mind, that's without New York apparently accurately reporting all the people who have died here. So probably over 160,000 anyway. And then even though our long-term care homes house only 1% of the population, 
that represents 36%, over a third of our deaths. So looking at the downside alone, isolation and lockdown seems like a really necessary and uh, a good response. But remember, there's always a downside to not doing things like visitation too. So over the months, we have discovered the downside to isolation and lockdown. And here's just a few examples loneliness and social, social isolation. And even before we had a pandemic, there's a bulk of literature showing the physical, psychological, and cognitive effects of loneliness and social isolation. Loss of family contact, loss of touch. And people do have assistance with care, but often it's a very clinical, non-intentional, non-affectionate touch, not the kind that people really need uh, to feel cared for. There was weight loss, there's subnutrition, people sleeping poorly, and a sort of a failure to thrive syndrome where people would just decline and were felt to even die more rapidly because they seem to have given up on life. There's also increased distress, particularly among people with dementia and increased use of both physical and chemical restraints. And Stephen Kay from UCSF calculated that there may have been 40,000 excess non-COVID deaths in those US care homes due to the isolation and lockdown. Some of this was due to direct depression, giving up, failure to thrive. Some of it was due to uh, the inability to maintain other chronic illnesses. So failure of routine dental appointments on oral hygiene and being able to eat well, or failure of monitoring of cardiac health or other conditions. So as you can see, um, the downside to not allowing visitation is also very significant. And when we quarantine people to their rooms, it seems logical again, but what are the downside risks? Well, first of all, when you're stuck in a small space, you have decreased mobility. And for older people, that's decreased appetite, it's poor sleep, it's deconditioning, it's loss of muscle strength, depression, worsening balance, you name it. And when people have distress and are inappropriately given psychoactive medications like antipsychotics, that leads to sedation, to decreased appetite, to increase gait and balance and fall. And if you're gonna get infected, a greater risk of atelectasis of the lungs, a greater risk of high fevers. Uh, so many, many side effects to these drugs too. Um, I might mention, since we did do the poll, I agree with Susan that because we've suspended the quarterly reporting, we don't know where things are at. I think anecdotally, it sounds like a lot of people are using more physical and chemical restraints for people with dementia who can't remember the infection control procedures. But I just wanna remind people that if you cannot remember to wash your hands, to wear a mask, to stay six feet away from people, where you should walk and where you shouldn't, um, there is no pill that helps a person with dementia to remember those things. So the only thing we do with the medication is we sedate people and increase the risk of all these side effects, increase the risk of harm, increase the risk of death if they do get infected. So I really think that the use of uh, antipsychotics or other psych meds just because people cannot follow infection control uh, procedures is really not defensible uh, in long-term care. You have to follow other, other approaches and we have many other approaches that we've talked about in previous talks. But on to principle number four from Eden, from Eden and Greenhouse founder, uh, Bill Thomas, the only risk-free human environment is a coffin. We see that there's risk when we do things and there's risk that we don't think. So that leads to principle number five, which is that we can never eliminate risk. We can only negotiate risk. We have to balance the upside and downside as best as possible for every individual situation. Let's go back down under for a moment to Stephen Cornelison, who's the CEO of Mercy Health, an excellent provider in Australia. And Stephen gave a global aging webinar a while back talking about how they were able to keep their visitation open even during a fairly intensive lockdown that happened in Australia. And what Stephen did was he didn't let surplus safety affect his critical thinking skills. We see that with using antipsychotics for lack of social distancing. And we see it for um, thinking that family members immediately are bad, whereas employees are immediately good. And Stephen realized that the virus doesn't know whose hand it's on or who is carrying it around and that we need to stick with the science. And so what they did at Mercy Health was they continued to identify the essential relatives, family members of people living in their homes, and they kept up visitation, but there were parameters. The people that wanted to visit needed to do both the online and on-site infection control training 
that their employees did, and they needed to demonstrate competencies just like their employees did. They needed to follow certain guidelines about planning ahead when to visit so it wasn't everybody at once. They needed to shower, come directly there, and then go directly home after visits. So there were definitely parameters around it, yet in doing so, they were able to keep visitation open without causing any spike in uh, infections. And keep in mind, once again, when we talk about critical thinking, when you think about it, who do you think is infecting most of the people in aged care with coronavirus? Do you think that it's employees or do you think that it's family members? I don't know the answer to that, but if I were weighing risk, I would say that the person who's pretty much sheltering at home, going out for necessities, um, and just coming in occasionally to see one person is probably much less of a risk than somebody who's working full time in healthcare, maybe even in various environments, different environments going from place to place. So once again, use the science and we can negotiate risk. And principle six goes along with that. We should never ask what's the risk of doing something without also asking what is the risk of not doing it. It was almost um, nine years ago, next week, I think, or two weeks from now that we opened uh, the community-based greenhouses at St. John's home where I used to work. And on moving day, this was one of our elders who was delighted because they're cutting off her ID bracelet. Because once again, when you go from a large building with hundreds of residents to a small 10 person household with consistent staffing, you don't need to look at someone's ID bracelet to know whether you're giving a medication to the right person. So all simple, right? We're all done, right? Not quite. This is where I've stopped in previous talks. I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into the works now because it is more complicated than what we have just talked about, upside and downside. Principle number seven says the risk is actually much more than just a two-sided coin. It's more than upside and downside. It has multiple facets that also need to be taken into account. And uh, while showing you that item uh, as we go through, I'll just let you look at that picture and decide, speaking of perspective, whether you think those two gray triangles are bowing toward the viewer or away from the viewer. But anyway, here are some of the other factors in the infection rates. Two questions. Do you think that all these excess infections and deaths in US homes were simply due to poor infection control? Do you think the people that work in nursing homes don't know how to wash their hands or put gowns on? Or if you're looking at upside and downside, do you think all these deaths came just because we didn't properly balance the upside and downside of isolation versus visitation and social engagement? Well, there are many, many more factors that led to infections and deaths in the US and elsewhere. Operational, such things as rotating staff to different living areas or agency staff coming in from outside, low pay and benefits, people that could not afford to take sick time without pay because inadequate sick time was covered. The need to work more than one job to fill a roster or to make a living wage so people went to more than one place. Lack of adequate protective equipment, lack of adequate testing, a lack of contract contact tracing uh, in, predominantly in this country. And we also know about the defective uh, PPE that was sent out by the government to a lot of places so it couldn't even be used properly. Then there are the design factors, multi-person bedrooms. And for those of you who live in other countries, yes, the US and Canada still put a lot of people who are not related to each other in double rooms and they have shared toilets. And then there's often a shower down the hall that everybody is taken to. Um, my colleague, Andrew Costa up in Canada, who did an analysis of COVID in Ontario, uh, his group published in JAMDA and they estimated that about, um, if you lived in a double room, it just about doubled your risk of death from COVID compared to a private room. Uh, large and or crowded living areas. So 30 or 40 people in a living area instead of 10 or 12. Little ability for people to distance in common areas and little or no access to the outdoors. But then there's more too. There's all the macroscopic societal factors. There's a prevalence of infection in the community. The Ontario group found that this also tied into infection rates within the homes. And then there's the behavior of local citizens. Are people following guidelines or are they marching in the streets without masks or going to uh, parties on the beach um, and not um, being careful about infection control? What about long-term care reimbursement? Has it been adequate? Most US homes had to do their own COVID testing once or twice a week. It costs the larger homes millions of dollars uh, to test their employees each month. And then when people got reimbursement dollars, how were they allocated? Were they given to help 
with this. And we've heard the famous story of the big organization here that uh, is now being faulted for shuttling a lot of their uh, a lot of their um, money for relief uh, to the execs instead of to uh, the care of the elders. There are inflexible regulations and inconsistent leadership, messaging from government at all levels. And once again, it's not just the government that hasn't been on top of this, it's the citizenry that has also not been on top of this and also shares the blame for this infection rate. Now, as you know, it just came out in JAMNA, Cheryl Zimmerman, Carol Dumont Stryker and others have published a study that showed that COVID infections and deaths in the greenhouse homes were only a tiny fraction of those seen across the traditional US nursing homes. I believe the final tally was that the death rate was only about 1 20th, 5% of what was seen elsewhere. And once again, do you think the people that work in greenhouses are the only ones who know how to follow infection control policies and procedures? I don't think so. But if we look back at some of those other factors, they were able to control some of those things. They have smaller households. They have all private rooms with ensuite showers. They have consistent staffing in most of the homes. They have no agency in most of the homes. They have direct access to the outdoors. They have large central living areas where people could distance during meals and activities. They have versatile staff. So you don't have to have lots of people from different departments coming in for activities, for meals, for housekeeping on a day-to-day -day basis. So once again, balancing risk is about going deeper than just the direct upside and downside. So I've got some concluding lessons here, eight of them. First of all, negotiating risk is complex. I wish I could make this simpler for you. Um, I'm sorry if this is more confusing than helpful, but we need to know that this is a complex thing. It involves dialogue with multiple stakeholders. And uh, my friend, Dr. Amy Kiyota just did a, uh, a global aging study of the experiences of COVID in 11 care homes across, uh, I'm sorry, 11 countries care homes. And one of the big messages that I heard in her report was that policymakers, regulators did not talk enough to providers. They did not talk enough to direct support workers or elders either. This requires flexibility and individualization to best succeed. And I'll be unpacking that in a couple more of these lessons. But keep in mind that many of the important precepts of the culture change movement that we've had going for several years help create the flexibility and the individualization needed for this. We have had instruction out there for a long time on things like flexible waking times, flexible dining, how to recruit staff, how to cons create consistent assignments how to eliminate agency, how to create better design, how to move to our private rooms. We know how to do this. We just have not been paying attention. And so our infrastructure has been a big problem with COVID as much as infection control per se. Other lessons learned, people are unique as are their desires and their individual tolerances for risk versus benefits. So we can't have a blanket one size fits all regulation because those policies and procedures will always result in the degree of harm for some, if not most of the people who are affected by those regulations. We need individualization and it's not easy, but it's the only way to negotiate risk optimally. Um, I worked with my, my colleague and great friend, Rebecca Priest several years ago at St. John's. And we talked about moving from policies and procedures to principles and values so that we don't have hard and fast black and white, all or none thinking, but we actually can use our values and our principles to guide individual situations. And finally, thinking almost a year ago to Ann Basting's wonderful webinar about engagement during the pandemic, she said, you know, some factors aren't within our control, like some of the regulations that are being handed down. But Anne, as an old improv artist said, use the yes and approach. Yes, this is the latest regulation and this is how we're going to maintain um, social engagement, how we're going to maintain meaningful living for the people involved in spite of the parameters that are given to us. So um, my last comment is while this pandemic is extremely complex, it's the biggest challenge we faced in long-term care. Many other discussions of upside and downside risks, such as people's dietary preferences, removing alarms, walking, going outdoors, unlocking doors become much, much easier if we use the above thinking and the above approaches. So I'll just finish with a photo I took after walking in the northern suburb of London several years ago. This was a nice uh, age uh, inclusive community and somebody decided to take their motorized scooter down to the pub and have a couple of pints. So once again, we're negotiating risk and we're enjoying quality of life in a reasonable way. And uh, thanks everybody for your attention. I hope I've left plenty of time for um, discussion because I know this is a very uh, thorny and controversial topic. Thanks again. 
So thank you, Al. That was uh, tremendous. And I think for me, what you did better than anything was just show us how complex the situation really is. But a couple of things that I want to say before I open. Yeah, Can I ahead. jump in? I didn't talk about the snakes. I promised to talk about the snakes. Oh, please do. How I negotiated risk. First thing I did was I, um, I talked to Jason, my host, and he said, you know, it's still early spring here. They're probably still hibernating. And when they come out, they're a little bit, they're a little bit sleepy anyway. And he said, you know, the do guys, they're venomous, but they, they're shy. They stay away from people. And I said, okay, well, that's much better. He said, of course, the tiger snakes, that's another thing. He said, they get really cranky when they come out of hibernation. You want to stay away from them. So, so that gave me a little pause, but there was an eight or nine foot wide paved path going to the beach. So I could see where I was walking. So I went to the beach and, and there were lifeguard stations only 20 to 30 yards apart. And they said, stay between the stations. There, there are fewer riptides and currents here. And so I didn't go out too deep. I, I stayed where I was supposed to, I got in. So I negotiated risk. It's not like I did anything foolhardy. And I think we all do that uh, all the time. So anyway, go ahead. No, thank you. I'm sure everybody was um, on the edge <laughs> of their seats waiting <laughs> for you to finish up that part. So you really talked about how the, the complexity of the situation. A few things that you said I thought was really important. I just want to um, put a punctuation on that. The one size fits all approach. And I really do think that's typically our institutional default thinking. So can you talk just a little bit about how our mindset needs to shift? You kind of talked a little bit with Ann Bastings, uh, the yes and approach a little bit. I think you were kind of implying, well, instead of saying this is why we can't, well, why, how can we make something happen? So talk a little bit from a mindset perspective and, and what we can do to just really shift our thinking first and our own perspectives. I think part of it is shifting our thinking, but part of it is we are hampered by the system we've created. Unfortunately, I'll go back to Athena's article about clock time and task and about the institutional model. And we have actually hemmed ourselves in. So how can you individualize uh, when you have a system that doesn't give you the time and space and ability to individualize? First of all, you may be rotating staff. And so you can't even be with people long enough to see them as individuals because somebody else from another area is gonna be taking care of them tomorrow. Secondly, you may have a tray line bringing breakfast to 7.30 and that makes it very hard to get people up when they want to and have people have an individualized breakfast. And, and um, in another case, you might uh, have, you know, be relying completely on your activities professionals to provide engagement because, because the nursing and, and CNA jobs as carer jobs are so compartmentalized that they do not feel that they can spend time engaging elders in ways other than the clinical ways that they're trained to do. So until you start to break down these walls, it's very hard to see. You know, Mary would be much happier if she could just have someone take her for a walk at, at one o'clock in the afternoon after lunch. And, um, you know, if I can teach one of the carers, it's okay to do that. It's not goofing off and, and other people will cover for her and, and they'll share the load. Um, or if I can make uh, people's activity schedules and waking schedules more flexible, then we can start to change our policies to be more flexible. But it's actually the system we've put ourselves in that forces us to only see 40 people living there and saying we can't do one thing for one person because we can't do it for everybody. And so a lot of it is going back to those culture change lessons and starting to work on the system. And, you know, as in my many years as an Eden educator, uh, you know, our script was that there was physical and operational and personal transformation. And the personal transformation is the most important. And I do agree that the mindset is critical, but I've learned from a practical standpoint that with good training, you can change people's mindset. It's the physical, it's the operational aspect that is the biggest uh, difficulty. And that's where the leaders on this call need to understand that you need to be actively involved in breaking down those operational barriers. The, the hands-on uh, direct support workers cannot do that. They don't have the formal authority to do that. And so leadership has got to take an active role in enabling the kind of flexibility that, that we need. So I guess that's kind of taking your question another way, but that to me is where the critical error no. is. That was, that was important. And I think even what you uh, talked about with regards to consistent staffing and how important that was, that would be an operational or a system yeah. 
something that could you know, should I, be changed right away. You know, a perfect example, Susan, is the greenhouse. And I know the greenhouse as well. I've been to many. My mother's living in St. John's greenhouse homes right now. And and um, and um, that's just an example that when you break down the household size to 10 or 12, when you give people more versatile roles, when you are able to flex meals and waking up, when you're able to create, you know, people that can that can do many things and aren't just locked into one job uh, compartment, many of these things around policies and procedures have become more flexible because you put yourself in the system where it can happen. And that was the brilliance of the operational aspect. Everybody looks at the house, which is gorgeous, but the brilliance of the operational aspect is what has made this be more successful in these types of small household models. And I can see St. John's up there in, in, in uh, Janet, our host's um, photo. In the picture, yeah. <laughs> Where my mother lives in the house next door to that one. Yeah, well, and it, it really is the interplay. I mean, yes, the house, the house that we see on the screen is a beautiful house and I have been there and I, I love the architecture and the physical design, but it really is the way the architecture as well as the empowerment of the staff and that philosophical culture and, and how that all kind of plays together. I want to ask you a little bit about your thoughts on elder choice and the apparent lack of control that they've had in being able to have the autonomy to make a choice. If, if I were an elder living in a greenhouse home and I wanted to hug my daughter, see my daughter, um, I'd be hard, I'd be rather upset that I, I was being told, no, sorry, you can't, and robbed of that choice. Is there anything from an advocacy perspective or anything that could, should be done? What can we do differently that really honors an elder's freedom to be able to exercise their autonomy, control, and even make a wrong choice? I don't care if I get COVID, I, I just wanna hug my daughter. Well, I've heard you call the dignity of risk, and, and I think right. that, that's a great term. You know, it's a, it's a great question, and my first uh, impulse was to jump to an obvious answer, um, but I have to, I have to kind of res restrain myself a little bit, too, and think about both sides of this. Um, um, I do know that I've heard different opinions. I've heard some people say exactly what you said. I don't care if I get COVID. I don't care if I die. I need my family. I need my spouse. I need my loved ones. Um, I've also heard of other people who were asked and said, you know what, we've lived through harder times than this. We're happy to be isolated for a while because, because we don't want to get sick. Um, and so, first of all, that, that stresses the importance of dialogue because, because people aren't the same. People don't all want the same thing. And uh, can we create some flexibility? I think we can, but I have to, and, and I do, I do want to, I want to respect and, and I personally feel like I'm the kind of person who would say, you know, I'd rather die than not be without my family for a year. Um, but I also have to recognize that I'm living in a household with other people. And if I get COVID, it may just not stay in my room. And, um, and the, the limit to choice is always when your choice starts to harm those around you. And so I have to acknowledge that and say it's not easy, like everything else is complex. But I think the way to get around that is to do what Stephen did at Mercy Health, use the science to enable it in the safest way possible. So he was able to honor the people that said, I'd rather die than be without my family, but he did it in a way that did not create untoward risk to the other people who live there who maybe were nervous about people visiting. Um, so once again, we just have to come up with a pathway that balances upside and downside. It can be done. Um, we have to hear what people want, see what their tolerance is for risk. And then, and I didn't go through this, it's from my old talk, but, but in my second book, I have a seven step process for negotiating risk, discussing it with a person and, and they can go through some of those steps to help find the safest choice. Wow, that was, that was beautifully said. Mary, I'm going to invite you on and just, uh, get out of the way and let some others that have expressed questions. We've got several in the Q&A box. So Mary, go ahead. Hi, Al. So the first thing I'll say is that there were some really nice comments about the presentation, that it was an excellent one. Um, a quick, you know, easy question for you um, is, who's that cutie pie in the background? <laughs> <laughs> that is my grandson, Aiden, who was up here two weeks ago visiting. Um, and once again, you know, his parents got COVID tests and we all sort of did our negotiating risk and. And that snowman still has a remnant out in the front yard because it hasn't gotten very warm here in the last couple of weeks. 
That's cute. Because yeah. someone actually said, who are the two people in the background? Yeah. And I'm well, like, two the people. Other not, the other one, I guess, is Frosty. I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> Iden has a couple of favorite expressions now. One of them is, um, I love that idea. And the other one is, that's not my favorite, which he'll say after some food that he tries. So yeah. <laughs> that's interesting. Very sweet. A two-year-old, yeah. <laughs> So this was an early question and you had mentioned an article. And so someone had asked, what was the name of the article you recommend? Uh, well, Athena McLean's on the call. Maybe she could pop it into the Q&A box if she's still on. It is called okay. something like, uh, you know, something about a, a um, an advocacy or a, no, that's not the word, something, uh, a call to the return of live time um, or something like that. Or, or uh, it has to do with the cult of clock time and task. Okay. And it's in my first book. I can, uh, I can pop it. it uh, to you. If, if she's not on or can't pop it in the, the question box, I'll make sure I do that. It's a wonderful paper and it was just so great to see her. It's been many years since I uh, communicated with her. Okay, because we could also just when we follow up with everyone out, you know, that is attending, we can actually send that link or whatever. So I think that that's Oh, there it is. Thank you, Athena. Oh, yeah, uh, there you go. Dementia Care is a moral enterprise. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the wonderful uh, main title. Thanks. Nice. Um, so here's a question. It said, they asked, navigating risk and risk, risk tolerance has been difficult with mandates from regulatory bodies. We were not given options related to visitors. Mm -hmm. It was highly mandated. How do we find ways to manage this? Yeah, um, I think we have to continue to dialogue with the regulators and dialogue with each other because people are coming up with things. I, I think of the hug glove, you know, that, that big plastic sheet that people are using that you can hug people through, um, you know, or, or outdoor visits or window visits. They're all different gradations and some are better than others. But as I said, uh, from Emmy's uh, COVID study, uh, the need for regulators to talk to providers, to talk to the, the, uh, the people who live and work in our care homes is really, really important. And, and we have to follow what groups like the greenhouse model did. And that is they were able to take the regulations and find ways to meet the intent of the regulations without being concrete. So the perfect example that Steve McAlilly gave way back in your first video was that uh, the regulations say you need a nursing station. They don't have one, but they provide the functions of a nursing station so that everything that the regulators think needs to be done is taken care of and done well. So once again, it's partly um, reinterpreting the regs, um, use some of our great educators like Carmen Bowman from Colorado, who's a former regulator, who can tell you how to, um, how to meet regulations in the way that, that culture change not only supports but demands and, um, and keep in contact with the regulators and let them know what you're doing and make a dialogue out of this. Because I think that there's not enough dialogue going on right now with all stakeholders. So another one was, where do you see best see the upside and downside analysis implemented? I'm sorry, where is? The question is, where do you best see the upside downside analysis implemented? So, I don't think that there's a given model. I think getting back to the other part of Susan's question I didn't answer, it is the mindset. It's the mindset of leadership that we are going to look at risk downside risk versus upside, or danger versus quality of life, safety versus quality of life, safety versus autonomy, however you want to, to provide those things. And once again, understand that these are not polar opposites. Uh, let me give you an example. Our good friend, Mike, uh, that we all know on, uh, in the panel, uh, just announced on uh, Facebook that after six and a half years living with Louis by dementia, he is going to re-engage something he lost and he's going to start driving again. Now you might think, oh my God, nah, well, there's plenty of people living with dementia who are driving cars. My friend John out of Brisbane, Australia does it too, but they all set parameters around it. So only during the day, only in my immediate neighborhood or to a couple of familiar places, only when the weather is good, only maybe when someone's with me or when someone knows my plan. So by setting parameters, you know, we always empower with guidelines. We always empower with boundaries. And so we have to understand that it's not just this all or none, you know, chaos, danger versus lockdown. It is how do we move in a sequential way so that we can start to broaden our, our horizon, start to take on risk. And if you take on the lower downside first and get good at it, and, and you know, if you, I, I give an example, I've given an example of my previous risk talks of something like, for instance, removing alarms, if you use lots of bed and chair alarms, um, you know, if you got 20 people in a neighborhood that have alarms, 
don't take them all off on day one. Find the person whose needs you think are easiest to meet without an alarm, come up with a care plan and do it. And when you have an 80 or 90% success, then pick somebody else. And two things happen. Number one, there's a learning curve. You start to learn what else you can do instead of using this institutional approach. And number two, every time you meet one more person's needs, your team has to shift the way they do things slightly. And by the time you get to the 20th person who you thought could never live without an alarm, you have made so many incremental shifts in the way you do things, in your flexibility, in your, in your teamwork and collaboration, that all of a sudden it becomes a much easier thing. So take it stepwise. You don't have to do it all today, but start taking the first step. And once again, hear people's concerns, talk to them and engage everybody, particularly those people who provide direct support because they've got the creative solutions, but they're too rarely asked what their ideas are. It kind of covers the second part of it, talked about the legality of things. And so it really is, it's like working that through. You know, legality, once again, um, I'm going to tell you something that I told a bunch of frustrated people and assisted living out in California a couple of years ago when they thought I was pushing them to do dangerous things. Um, but <laughs> but I, I said, you know, you in, in long-term care regulations in this country, and I know in Canada and most countries, you have got two directives that are in fundamental opposition to each other. One of them is the statement of resident rights. And the other one is the directive to keep people safe, which often infringes on their rights. So you are in a no-win situation. So do the right thing. Document it. Document the upside and downside, your thought process. So if someone does come in to investigate an incident, they can see the thought process behind it. Talk to the regulators up front. Let them know. Talk to family members. Don't surprise people with what their loved one is doing when they walk in the door. And this is once again this part of my seven-step process that I outlined. But um, and I, you know I could cut and paste that section of the book, and you can include that maybe as a as a later handout uh, for people. Um, but but the idea once again is that we have to follow a process and we have to engage people and we have to understand that you know times change when it comes to liability and uh, when i started in long-term care family members would say if you untie my mom i will sue you if she falls and then family members started saying if you tie my mom i will sue you family members used to say if you don't give my mom a drug for her behavior i'm going to sue you then I started getting cold called by lawyers all over the country that wanted me to testify in lawsuits against nursing homes who were giving antipsychotics, uh, which I didn't do, but, but I mean, it's out there. And so uh, as human rights move and, and resident rights move to the forefront, um, that becomes a shift in the balance of our, our view of liability. And believe me, my generation, the baby boomers, we are going to push for those rights harder than the people before us did. So uh, lawyers can hang on to their hats. <laughs> so there's another question, someone who said that they're a care partner for a 94-year-old gentleman and want to create a risk agreement with him. Is there a best practice for creating this kind of agreement? I feel like you started kind of talking about that with Mike Belleville and, you know, and, and having boundaries, but is there a generic tool you would recommend I use and build upon? And I, I don't know if there is. Something. I would love to have you refer that to somebody who you know, who's in the legal profession. I don't have a generic tool. I have done written contracts in the chart uh, back at St. John's. And uh, when I worked there with people that wanted to eat food that we thought might not be safe, those kinds of things. Um, know that there is no legal protection for a contract like that. Because having somebody sign a waiver does not mean that you can't be sued. Um, but it does give you documentation of the thought process. And once again, I know this doesn't always happen in real life, but I've had several regulators tell me that we don't expect that nothing bad will ever happen in a care home. But if something does happen and we come in to investigate, we'd like to be able to open the chart and see that there was a thought process behind what was done instead of just reckless behavior. And so um, that's the best you can do. Obviously, we're, we're subject to the, the quirks of an individual person who comes in and investigates a case. And we know that regulators are individual, unique people too. They all see risk differently. And some of them are gonna, are gonna be more towards surplus safety than others. We have to just do the best we can. But once again, COVID is a sign that a lot of things need to change. Uh, our long-term care homes need to change in design and operations, but our regs need to change. Our reimbursement mechanism needs to change. I think this is the ideal time to challenge everybody across the board to look at themselves, look in the mirror and say, what, how did I fail people during the coronavirus epidemic with what I've been doing 
in my work because we all have done it. Um, and uh, so we need to be honest about that and we need to come together to use this opportunity to reframe long-term care in the way that sadly the culture change movement has failed to do over 20 years. I'm gonna turn it back to Susan. I'm just gonna say two things. Someone asked about the greenhouse study on COVID findings, if that's available to the public and it is. And Susan, I believe that's on the website. And the other um, question someone had was how greenhouse homes have handled in-person visits. So I just thought I'd toss it back to the two of you and then I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. So um, Al, I'd love for you to talk about how you've been able to visit or not visit your mom. So let's let's start there and make it as personal as, as can be. Well, it's been, it's been up and down because the regulations keep going back and forth and we don't always get a consistent message. And, and so that's, that's important. But um, my first, I, I have two rules about COVID. I have my own theories about what I should be able to do and what I shouldn't be able to do. My two rules are number one, um, whenever I'm uh, in a room with somebody, I always default to the most nervous person. I will never do anything that makes somebody else nervous. If somebody wants a mask or wants me to stay a certain distance, I will do that because I don't want to make anybody upset. The second thing is that I will never uh, try to, you know, uh, flout the regulations I'm handed, whether I like whether, whether I love them or not. Uh, we have had times at Christmas time. My family was able to come in. My grandson was able to see my mother, um, and she has had complications that that made her more of an essential visitor category. So we've been able to come in maybe more than other families because of that. Um, more recently though, the new directives have come out, only people over 18. And, and so the last time, two weeks ago when Aiden was here, he had to do a window visit while I went inside. Um, they're requiring COVID tests uh, within a week. And even if you've had both vaccines, like my daughter who works in an emergency room has had, she still needs a COVID test before she can come in. Um, we're still using the, the gowns and the face shields to come in and we're getting our temperatures checked. Um, so, so, but, but we are able to come in and, and that has loosened up a little bit there. Um, and so that's, that's kind of where things are here. And I think it's going to be, once again, I, I think that some of the regulations make sense, some of them maybe don't. And there's a lot of inconsistency among states, among municipalities, among individual providers and how they, how they deal with the regulations. Uh, so, so I think we just have to work with, with our local people as best we can and just try to negotiate it the best way we can. Well, bottom line is our work is not yet done, Dr. <laughs> Power. There's, there's a lot more. You have really defined for us uh, the complexity of the situation and um, the systems and the status quo in which we find ourselves to kind of we're up against it. Um, somebody yes, made a I'm... comment that I thought was really important. Yeah. We truly see ourselves in the people we serve. All kinds of change will happen. And you kind of talked about boomers like ourselves. And we're not going to accept some of the control and the violation of human rights or whatever as our predecessors have. Any final comment before we go to our... our uh, all I'll say is that, that I guess what I hope to bring you is, is what, what the, the old folk singer Utah Phillips used to say was the characteristic of the Unitarian Church, and that is it's a place you can go to uh, get your answers questioned. And um, <laughs> so, so I, I hope I didn't muddy the waters too much, but the waters are muddy. And, and Jennifer Carson and I are, are working on a book now about how to create inclusive communities, how to unlock and desegregate memory care. And one of the prime points we have made in our presentations and we're going to make is that some of these things are complex. They're not simple and they're not complicated where an algorithm or a computer program will give you the answers. Complex means they involve human beings, uniqueness, relationships, and lots of uh, discussion and trial and error. And um, that's the world we live in. It's kind of a postmodern view, but uh, that's what we got. And I wish you the best of luck. Well, one quick one, I have to just say, when is your book expected out? This was a comment uh, in well, the chat. Well, you know, Jennifer came out with a world-class uh, approach to COVID for elders in the community in Nevada that she worked with, with elders. She worked with people with dementia. She worked with her husband, Peter Reed from University of Nevada. And um, it took a lot of their time last year. And I was engaged in some other projects too. So we kind of put things on hold for six months but we're back writing again. So I'm hoping we can have the manuscript done um, by mid-year. And does that mean it'll be out by the end of the year? Not sure, because uh, we don't know what this has done to the publication timelines too, the whole pandemic and staffing and everything, but we'll um, look for it hopefully sooner than later, because we think that this is the time to do it. And by the way, just the last thought too, is that um, the greenhouses by and large do not segregate people with dementia. 
So uh, this, and I really challenged myself because I was writing this book with the pandemic, but this shows that the fact of dementia is not the risk. So segregating people is not demanded by a COVID pandemic. Uh, because the greenhouse has proven you can have people with and without dementia living in the same house like my mother does and they have not had one COVID case in the year at, at the houses where my mother lives uh, among the residents. So, um, so once again with critical thinking we can say yeah there are some factors but the presence of dementia is not the overriding factor. I, beautifully said and while everybody is still on I know Janet you can go to those slides um, the last slide we have, so it's probably not going to come in order, but there is a dementia symposium on September 14 that the Greenhouse Project is putting on. Dr. Power, Jennifer Carson, um, who he is writing the book with, and Dr. Emmy Kyoda will be um, on that um, on that during doing the symposium with us. So we want to make sure you save the date. So there's a slide at the very end that you'll get. But our next um, social connectedness webinar will be on March 9 and Jack York will be back and he is actually going to really moderate a panel discussion. So what Dr. Power talked about today, he really gave us a very thought provoking presentation. Jack York will then say how have different people done it and he really is going into some greenhouse homes across the country and really getting people who have utilized that it's never too late and, and other ways to really keep their um, residents engaged. Next slide, please. Um, the following one, the very last one, uh, number six, Marla DeVries, our Director of Resource Education and myself, we're going to put it all together and really help you kind of create a strategy for moving forward. Next slide. Um, we have a design series coming up with Perkins Eastman and certainly Dr. Power referred quite frequently to the physical design of greenhouse homes and really thinking about the design and what we need to rethink and, and do differently with regards to the physical environment. And next slide, Elevate Elder Care. This was uh, our most recent episode with Katie Smith Sloan. If you're not a subscriber to our podcast, I would really welcome you to uh, find us on Apple, Spotify, or Stitcher. And final slide. Here you go, save the date. I really wanted to make sure that after uh, Dr. Power finished that you had September 14 on your calendars. And he, along with Dr. Carson and Dr. Kyoto, will be doing our dementia symposium. So really look forward to um, having you save the date and join us at that time. Thank you, Dr. Power. As always, I think we all have just benefited richly from your wisdom. I so thank you so much. I appreciate the chance to go back and challenge myself and take it a little bit deeper than I have. So thank you. Well, I think that's what we appreciate most about your work. And uh, it challenges us all to really think differently and to really identify within ourselves where there are areas to go beyond better. So thanks everyone for joining thanks, us everybody. today and we will see you in a couple weeks. Thanks Mary for your support. Thank you, Janet as well. Bye-bye, everyone.